So at the start of this, in maybe in a week or two, or maybe the numbers wouldn't be as high, but as it becomes apparent that it's not going to be, it's not going to go away that quickly, people need, now need to retrain their mind, their mindset and perception. And especially to move away from why we are here. Because what we find is um, leading to the non-compliance and acceptance is the fact that there's a lot of blaming if we had done this earlier, if we, if we went here at this time. So we find out that people are worried and rather than, you know, sticking to the stipulation, they are making other plans to address their fear and worry rather than stick to um, what's been, the messages being sent out about staying at home and things like that. So well, the way we started is to give out the information about mental acceptance and maybe some of the things they can do like mindfulness and the importance of mental well-being at this time because even without illness you know being in isolation is bad enough and then to make people realize that being in isolation doesn't mean you get the disease because that's another perception once you say isolation to them in another seven ten days i'm going to be out or i'm going to be hospitalized or it's going to get worse so it's about constant um education okay and um Looking beyond the end of COVID-19, if, if it's likely to see the end of COVID-19, but assuming that we, we address the issue and, social, and this uh, social isolation and self-isolation regime uh, starts to, uh, to loosen, I, I see there are probably a lot of um, problems with people in the care profession because they'll have been working out flat out for several weeks under high pressure. What's likely to be the impact of this on them? Yeah, it's, there's going to be a backlash. There's no doubt about it. Right now, the <clears throat> we've had suicide. We've had people just breaking down during, after their shifts, or even um, having conversation with family members, especially those who have family members abroad. When they phone to say, how are you doing? We've had people, you know, like breaking down and crying for hours on end. A, from the impact of, you know, the patients that they've been nursing and the way things can go down so quickly from, I was turning this patient two minutes ago. Now, you know, we are in the end of care. And especially because there's this notion that healthcare professionals are tough and that they can cope with things. We have the pressure of staff shortage, the pressure of trauma, and other things that goes on around us anyway that you have to cope with, like, you know, uh, patients involved in knives and guns and things like that. And multidisciplinary team coming together for hours on end and doing what they can and watching them every way. Now we have this on top of it. So you go into it, you're doing what you can to save this patient. The fact that you cannot do much has its own psychological implication. The fact that you you are scared you are going to be the carrier to infect your family members as their own uh, psychological implication the fact that you now have to cope with larger workload than before especially in intensive care and critical care in critical care there is a stipulated number of nurses ratio to patients that is like out of the window now mm -hmm. when you have people come to help with the little knowledge that they have and with the training that they've had to step up you still have to be the backup person to you know support them so you are supporting your colleagues you are supporting the patients you are thinking about your family so i believe that at the end of this we have to formally introduce um like the briefing as an official mm -hmm. part of our day mm -hmm. you know either through um, in, in, input it into the who checklist or into handing over and things like that and it's a good thing there are apps there from nhs england for healthcare professionals to access but the truth is by the time you get home you're thinking of going tomorrow it's you have little or no time to do that mm -hmm. so 
we have to make provision as we are making provisions to look after these patients in number both the asymptomatic ones and those who've got the COVID-19 we need to make plans now to support healthcare professionals in the next month six weeks yeah I, I thoroughly agree with you can I move on now to Michael and then we'll finish up with Simon um, Michael my cognition seems to me that uh, your uh, applications and uh, what you do is going to be quite important in this space. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah, we're very concerned about a number of cohorts of, of people in the United Kingdom. Clearly, there's the, the one and a half million people that asked to isolate. And, and I agree totally with Mary, you know, we, we've asked them to isolate. But we've also we've also created lots of other isolation mechanisms around them. You know, we're not able to deliver care the way we, we we're, the way we used to. And indeed, most of the NHS staff are, are positioned at trying to tackle the, the real key issue, which is people infected with the disease, you know, and, and that's, that's the priority, that's the acute priority. So, you know, we're trying to treat and manage these 1.5 million people with no, with no resources, with, with no way of delivering care, you know. And so, you know, in our opinion, I mean, this, this will radically change, this, this event will radically change how we deliver healthcare in the future. You know, I'm positive about the cats out of the bag. We'll have to use digital tech to reach into their own homes. And that's exactly what we want to do. We're very conscious of the fact that we know for a fact that people will leave isolation in a worse healthcare state than when they went in it. Yeah. And those effects are, are, are really quite damaging and serious. Um, I mean, we, there's a number of studies which have come out recently which demonstrate that the PTSD effects of isolation are, are higher than we imagine. There was a study that's been running for years called the Aging in, 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 in Longevity Study, which says that the cognitive deficit of people in isolation is there, is there for up to four years after the isolation has ended. And in fact, there was a recent survey that was just published by NHS providers here in the UK that said that the, that the, the, the mental illness associated with quarantine is there for up to five months after people have been released from quarantine. So, so the NHS knows all of this, you know, and they really need to get their act together to, to work with, with SMEs and digital companies like, like Liz was mentioning earlier on, so that we can mobilize these techs quite quickly. Where we come from as a, as a company is that we focus on, on, on improving people's cognitive fitness and mental resilience. You know, we talk about this great British resilient attitude, you know, and, and that's what we need to bolster. We need to get people able to cope better with the environment that they're in at the moment. And that's exactly what we do with our application. It, it goes directly into people's home. They can assess their, their cognitive performance. They can improve their cognitive performance. And, uh, and we're very lucky that we're already embedded in the NHS in a number of areas across the country to build mental resilience. You know, and, and the quarantine is lasting for about eight to 12 weeks, potentially, or maybe three to four months. Um, you know, our data tells us that we can significantly improve people's performance over that period and so that they can exit potentially this this isolation environment with the same resilience they had when they went in it hmm. and that's really really important because mental resilience is is in fact the behavior change the cognitive determinant of your mental health state mm -hmm. and so that that's where we operate at that and it also means too that it sort of lessens the impact and the requirement and the demand for for IAP services which we know are struggling to cope with the the, 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 the population as it is, let alone this extra one and a half million people that might be accessing it over the next coming weeks. Yeah. So that's where we that's where we fit as a company. We're part of a solution, we're not the whole solution, but we're an accessible solution which can be deployed at scale. I mean if we wanted to, we could reach a half a million people tomorrow, you know. Mm. And we have the mechanisms to do that and we've developed several super partnerships to do that as well. Yeah, I think that also brings out the important point that in tackling issues like COVID-19, it is not just a, a medical profession issue. It's a very multidisciplinary, multi-sector uh, problem. We all need to work together and understand what our strengths of our offerings are and uh, collaborate to, to, to make a difference. Because uh, I think as Mary intimated and, and you as well, Michael, uh, as you say, the cuts out of the bag, we have an opportunity at this time to build something that is better than what was before in trying mm -hmm. to go back to what was the previous normality 
uh, we may be caused more problems than thinking creatively about a new normality that will be provide better lives and healthier lives for everyone. So I don't remember. And, yeah, sorry. And you're right. You're right. You're right. It's you know when in the NHS when we normally deploy a service we. We're, we're doing our risk assessment. You know, what is the level of risk associated with this service, and what is the level of risk that the patient is under? You know, we put them in isolation, and nobody's done any risk assessment yes. as to what's the risk of putting them in isolation in the first place. Yes, <laughs> and um, and so you know, even though what we're talking about is 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 some of its preventative measures, absolutely, but it's about caring for people remotely. Mm. You know, and it can be done through digital technology. We can do all of the measurement, we can do all of the assessment, we can do all of the PHQ nines that we want to, you know, we can assess all of that. We've even in our super uh, partnership built in a COVID traffic track tracker mm -hmm. so that we can alleviate the concerns of some of the patients, you know, because they may be thinking, oh my goodness, have I got COVID-19, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and then we can signpost appropriately that resource and triage it appropriately back to the NHS provider, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. That's a sensible way of, of delivering care mm -hmm. for these, these, these at-risk populations. And it can be done, you know? And, but we, we've had to, we, we couldn't do that in isolation. We're working with a number of big companies mm -hmm. in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, um, we're doing that. I mean, we are exactly yeah. doing that right yeah. now. Yeah, I'm sure. No, I'm sure. David, I'm just going to dive straight in because you're yep, saying that do. you can't yep. do it alone. We, we have, and it's fascinating, you said the cat's out of the bag. The cat is out of the bag. We spent four years propounding the proposition that person-centered care is more than just a fluffy engagement between a carer and a nurse and the patient, and that it has real fundamental power of inducing well-being and indeed having a, a return on investment. And, you know, we've been getting there. We're in hospitals, daycare centers, memory clinics. Um, but what has happened in the last two weeks is that suddenly the world has recognized that knowing the person has a radical mm. impact on care. So we've gone from 40 care homes to 600 in the space of 10 days. We've gone yeah. from, we, in the last um, six months, we've been working with Europe's largest hospital group, who in the last, um, what is it, 10 days have said, yes, we'll give you a million patients, because they need to know the person. A carer will have a reduce stress load if they know the person and can find commonality of interest. Um, so a, a, a remarkable transition has taken place. And of course, the question is whether we'll slip back into those old ways before. But I don't think it's possible because um, you know, the, the old adage that the consumer is always right is going to take effect. Patients, families, the grandchildren are all going to expect to be treated um, like a person and not a number. And that's how I got into this. My mother was on medication because she daily for 15 years was treated like a number and the carer would discuss the weather. But the moment the carer discussed her life, she was off her medication. So I think we've turned a corner and I think we'll find that um, what we've got, which is remote connectivity, a means for the grandchild to build activities that automatically reach grandmother in the care home, a means for carers to, uh, to know the person bedside very easily, will change the nature of the relationship between all parties, carers, nurses, GPs, and the person care cared for. Um, I love that book um, called The Patient Will See You Now, which I'm sure you probably all know, but it's a great title and it kind of says it all. The, the era of empowering the patient, I think, is upon us. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt, David, I'll let you ask a question. No, 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 sure, no, no, you're right, Simon. So, so really, um, one of the other issues which uh, I think your applications develop, and perhaps you just say a little bit about what your applications actually do, but uh, one of the, uh, the things that occurred to me in our previous meetings and discussions is that uh, my, own, my own mother uh, died uh, from uh, dementia. Um, and uh, one of the things that occurred to me was that she had a number of different carers. And of course, every new carer meets my mum for the first time. They know nothing about her, so they can't develop a relationship with her. Whereas if you have the tools to help carers to be able to create a much more personalized relationship uh, with the patient, that really does have an impact on their well-being. Well, it has radical, radical impact. It has not only radical impact on the well-being of the patient, but also on the carer. So if you as a care business can assign carers that have a commonality of interest with the patient. I mean, if I have a carer come around to me, I'm going to want that patient to like Jimi Hendrix, and that carer to like Jimi Hendrix. And if that carer does, we're going to have a better relationship. And, <laughs> and my family are going to pay for companionship hours. So there's a return on investment there. So person-centered care is, has a remarkable impact. And, and the other thing, of course, that has to be said is that when it comes to care, 
um, the, pl the pleasure principle is often forgotten, we think. You know, Facebook has become powerful because everyone gets a dopamine hit. They get a reward. But in care, there's just not enough rewards. So we believe that um, as long as engagement can generate um, a return for the carer and the person, in whatever way that comes, whether that's incentive-based or whether it's the simple dopamine prin principle of finding a person that you enjoy engaging with, that radically impacts on care. And it takes the pressure off the NHS. I mean, we're able to reduce agitation and admission through knowing the person, reduce medication during the stay in a hospital through being able to deliver activities that fit that person's interests, and reduce the stay, in other words, reduce bed blocking through an empowered step-down process process all through knowing a person and we're doing that not a scale but we're about to do that at scale and interesting Liz if you're listening we're doing that in Europe not in the UK because the Europe is more accepting of new technology and we're able to move faster so we have a million patients coming our way within four months and we're yearning to do this in the UK once they begin to um, move a bit faster and I mean of course app assessment is critical but mm. um, it's it, it's got to become more flexible in our view uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's going to be America and Europe that are going to leapfrog the UK in terms of adoption of technology. Yes, uh, I, 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 I can see in whatever sector you're involved with, all of the uh, panelists uh, uh, today's session, the, there are uh, quite a number of barriers for small businesses to try and get involved in um, the digital medicine sector. Um, these barriers are very understandable in terms of patient safety etc and uh, uh, validity uh, but for some people um, it, it really denies the opportunity for innovation and one observation that i would make from my experience probably uh, it's probably around about 15 years now that i've been involved in digital technologies serious games with uh, healthcare type um, uh, applications is that a lot of projects seem to be based on the use of technology to reduce costs, to reduce the amount of time that a carer has to spend with a patient, to reduce uh, the cost of uh, uh, connecting to people. And, and really, I think there are so many opportunities to, to look at it the way that you're looking at it, Simon, and, and think of it in terms of actually improving the quality of care uh, and mm, consequently, exactly the overall cost benefit is going to be a lot, return on investment is going to be uh, a lot higher as a result of putting the patient first. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, exactly right. Sorry, please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you're absolutely right. It's about triage and need, isn't exactly. it? Because that's that's the way we, we get better bang for buck. And it means that we can distribute time better. So people that need more intensive support get more intensive support. And, and people that that really could get away with less intensive support are supported adequately and, and it's, we're not over-resourcing them. What we do as well, and we've noticed this with the work that we're doing in, in mild cognitive impairment and, and, and early stage dementia, and this is applicable for the 1.5 million people that are out there at the moment in isolation, is that we can profile people into different uh, cognitive health states and then we can identify those that we will know do, will do quite well, self-guided and self-regulated and we can identify those in, in, in lower cognitive functioning bands that would require more support, mm. you know, and therefore we can appropriate, uh, appropriate apply resources in a very, very sensible and, and an appropriate way and develop the right kind of methodologies and service specifications that will underpin good quality care. So, you know, we want to work with people and, and, and organizations to make that a reality. Um, and we can, you know, and, and, and we're currently starting that journey now. So if there's anybody else out there that wants to explore that with us, we would love to. Okay, thanks very much, that, Michael. Mary, can I ask you for any final comments before we move back to the final networking and Q&A? Q &A? Can you switch your microphone on, Mary? You're still mute at it now. Yeah, it's on now. Yeah, so my final comment will be the... Um, appreciation of everything that's been put together, especially on what we are discussing right now, because they are not only useful for patients or the community, they are useful for healthcare professionals in the clinical area as well. Because, and that's why I jumped on the thing when Liz was talking about the resources to share the link with us. Because the other aspect to being at the front line is the fact that people are not even ill will ask you questions. 
about what's happening what do i do what do we do so it's nice to be able to signpost them to all of these resources available the apps the what we're doing in you know areas to reassure them at the same time while we cope with what we are dealing with in the front line that, that's wonderful well we we're coming up to the final networking session before we bring this to a close i will just give um our delegates the opportunity to put their hand up if they have any uh, uh, questions they want to come on stage and say something with our uh, panelists if any of you just put your hand up and i can bring you onto the stage doesn't look as if we've got anybody who wants to volunteer to come forward, but uh, never mind. Um, we go into the final networking session. So this is your last opportunity in the last 10 minutes to uh, network around different tables, uh, speak to other delegates, speak to our excellent uh, panelists. Um, and this event has been recorded, not completely because I forgot to press the record button once or twice but uh, so some of it will be partial but uh, this the uh, recording of this event will be uh, posted at some time in the near future so it remains for me to thank all of the panelists and all of the participants for joining us today I think it's been an excellent session I've learned a lot uh, and I think it's uh, just a starting point for what I hope will be some quite regular types of events. So thank you once again.